Good afternoon, or maybe it's morning where you are. I'm Eric Schumacher Rasmussen. I am the editor in chief and VP of streaming media and the chair of Streaming Media Connect and all of our conferences. Thanks for joining us for our seventh virtual event. This has been a really good one. And uh, we've got the rest of the afternoon and tomorrow to go, We're wrapping things up on Friday with the best streaming gear and how to use it workshop. So if you haven't signed up for that, I think the folks who are here for this NDI and SRT discussion will want to join that on Friday. We'll be back in person though, in Boston in May, May 24th and 25th for Streaming Media East. On May 23rd, we'll kick things off with the Content Delivery Summit and the Streaming Media University workshops. We will be putting the program online any day now. Registration's already open though. You can check things out at streamingmedia.com forward slash East. I'd like to thank our sponsors for this week. And that's Bird Dog and Harmonic. And we've got a couple of video messages from them right now. And just for being here, you will be entered into a random drawing to win an Amazon gift card. We'll announce the winner at the end of this panel. Before we jump in, a few housekeeping notes. If you have questions for the panel, please put them in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom window rather than in the chat. It just makes it easier for us to keep track of things. Also, we are running live transcripts. If you're seeing them on your screen and you wish not to see them on your screen, you can click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and then select disable transcript. We're doing a complete, I don't know if it's a 180, maybe a 270, something like that from our last panel, which was about fast OTT services. We're digging in deep here with NDI and SRT and why you should care about them if you are producing live streaming events. So with that, let me welcome our panel and our moderator, Casey Charvet from Gigcasters in Austin. Casey, how are you? I'm doing great. Good to see you again, Eric. Good to see you again. Hopefully the next time we see each other, we'll actually be in person. Sure that. Indeed. Well, I will let you take it away and take it from here and introduce your panelists. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, yep, I'm Casey Charvet. I'm the managing director and founder of Gigcasters. We are an engineering and software uh, consulting company specializing in live video and streaming media. And so we've got a great panel today. Uh, we've got Chris Steble from Uncle Toad's Media Group. We've got Corey Smith from Activision Blizzard's Esports Group. And we've got Justin Reed from Word Up Productions. So thank you all for attending. Good to see y'all again as well. And as Eric said, hopefully next time we'll be doing this in person. So uh, let's get things kicked off. Um, I thought it might be fun. I posed a question or a challenge to our panelists uh, ahead of time uh, to come up with an analogy for NDI uh, versus SRT. And uh, did anybody come up with a good one that they wanna share with the group? Nope. Okay. I'll give mine. I'll give mine then and, and then we can debate it. Sorry. All right. I thought this was, I thought I was so clever here. All right. I would, uh, I would, I would take it to the uh, home cooking world. And I would say that uh, SRT is like uh, my cast iron skillet and NDI is like my countertop air fryer. Uh, they will both get a similar job done, but in vastly different ways. 
um, and each has their own application. I love them both. Um, and uh, one is a lot more sort of, of a packaged unit with mysterious things happening inside. And the other is uh, that being NDI, uh, kind of incorporating a lot of different elements into one thing and SRT being a, uh, a very um, robust uh, tool to use in many different applications, uh, but just a part of the picture. So um, we can, uh, you can call me out on that as we get into the technical details. Um, I want to give everybody a chance to introduce themselves though. Uh, Chris. Yeah, hi. Yeah. Um, no, good to be here. I love your analogy. That's probably a really clear way of putting it. You know, they're both tools, but they do different things. Um, but anyways, yeah, I'm Chris. I'm from Uncle Toad's Media Group. Uh, we're a small boutique uh, production agency doing uh, live sports, live music. And uh, yeah, yeah, just coming off a big job. And uh, yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for joining us, Corey. Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, Corey Smith, Director of uh, Live Operations for Activision Blizzard Esports. Uh, my team and their charter is basically managing all of the technology stack from glass to glass. So all the way from acquisition of Signal through any uh, cloud-based production workflow, archive for asset management systems, transmission, distribution to our media partners, uh, and kind of all of the things that make esports work. So. Great. And, uh, and Justin. I'm Justin Reed. I'm my company is Word Up Productions. I do uh, live streaming. I'm a director, technical director, producer. Um, I also, my company also gets hired to do installations for live streaming installations and music venues. And I get into engineering um, and crewing, sort of, uh, sort of all around production. Um, and I work for lots of big and small clients alike. Um, been doing this for quite a long time, for 15, 20 years, and um, love what I do. Glad to be here. Uh, thank you all for joining. Um, okay, so I think uh, we can, we'll, we'll accept it as a given that NDI and SRT are different. We'll, we'll get into the things that make it different in a second, but I wanna throw a question uh, out to the whole group, starting with Chris, um, why do we use these tools? Um, and, and not, you know, you can, you can start with in general and then maybe why one and why SRT and why NDI, but broadly speaking, what's so cool about these technologies and why do we use them? Yeah, I mean, I think like any new technology, um, we use them because they're convenient and they're making things easier and more robust uh, in, in all sorts of ways. Um, you know, I think that we're tapping into new technologies because network connected devices are becoming quicker, more affordable, more accessible. Um, and it, it is kind of democratizing production in a ton of different ways. Um, you know, before the call, we were talking about remote productions and how these tools are really enabling remote productions, which has become um, really clear and important, as we've seen over the last couple years, uh, more than ever, the ability to work from home, um, the ability for new players to get into production. So I think it's, it's fun and exciting to see what people can do with these tools that weren't always originally designed to do the things that people end up using them for. Um, but also just the ability to, to jump in and, and, and kind of play in, in areas that were typically reserved for, you know, bigger budget projects or higher end broadcasters. So um, I, I see them as just being kind of new uh, arrows in the quiver, to, uh, you know, for a lack of a better term. Very cool. Corey, what's, what's your take? When, why does Activision Blizzard and you get excited about these techs? Um, I think, you know, so the, on the onset of COVID, like everybody had to flip the script on like trying to figure out how to keep their live production happening. Right. So a lot of what we did was try to figure out like, what are the, the, the right high quality protocols that we should be gravitating towards? You know, uh, there's all kinds of sort of decision points that have to be made throughout the course of the show. Um, and how do we connect all the components of that show together in kind of a cohesive manner? So we used 
a lot of NDI in our cloud-based production workflow to basically tie everything together because we could get, you know, high quality, high bit rate transport amongst all of the kind of core components in our AWS workflow together between graphics and replay, the actual uh, main switchers, our mass control environment, the ability to, to take and uh, uh, shim like singular graphics into that, whether it was virtualized Viz Trio in the cloud. And we basically surrounded it by this NDI workflow uh, that allowed us to do also do scan work from player PCs sitting in the cloud. We call them observer cameras, but essentially they're the, the virtual camera that flies through the map that kind of tracks the action during the course of a, an esports match. We were using a lot of Parsec to log into these machines. So we weren't having to deal with local internet issues, but NDI was the main feed into a lot of our production switchers uh, for this particular purpose. We use SRT for more or less the lightweight contribution that we brought casters and other desk talent into our live, you know, kind of production workflow environment, converting it to NDI as it came through as it hit the switcher. So we kind of looked at it as NDI is great when you're on a kind of local area network kind of provisioned environment, like you would be in a physical studio somewhere, but also SRT gave us the ability to do low latency kind of light lift uh, in high quality for people sitting in their houses and bedrooms and apartments all over the place that really the ISPs that they have at their house is really geared towards a consumption model and not necessarily a contribution model. So that you may have 200 megs down, but you only have 15 up. So how do you get that contribution out? So SRT was really the, we couldn't have done that with NDI anyways, with at least with NDI 4, NDI 5 kind of opens up the, the boundaries for us to actually do WAN routing uh, and, and potentially compete again with some of the like Sienna type software that's out yeah. there today that allows us to go from cloud to cloud or from ground-based productions to cloud uh, to do some of that contribution and, and workflow management. But I, we see NDI and SRT as two different protocols for two different use cases entirely. So it's hard to come up with an analogy for that when kind of NDI is your, your core infrastructure uh, and SRT is kind of like the, on the outside, uh, allowing me to do high quality contribution. Very cool. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll dig into some of the network nuances uh, here in just a second. Um, a very interesting point about using NDI for the observer cams. I hadn't even thought of that. You know, and you're in a pre-NDI workflow. Could you give us some color on how you would have had to set that up uh, to have your observer PCs? Pre-COVID, we would just basically have essentially, you know, uh, HDMI output from these PCs at a venue somewhere, at a tournament somewhere, uh, and we would run local scan converters and convert it to SDI from there. So when we were on the ground be prior to 2020, a lot of our stuff was all very ND, uh, very SDI-based baseband workflow. Uh, it's only till we had to basically provision uh, to kind of go online with our shows that we really started to think about, like, how do we build our infrastructure and what tools are out there like NDI, SRT, you know, JPEG XS is now being kind of popular, you know, what do we, WebRTC, there's all these different kind of options to use RIST, et cetera, to kind of get things in and out of our environment. We needed to kind of stabilize our workflow on a set of core kind of uh, components and NDI just happened to be one of those that we chose for the cloud infrastructure because of the ability to do um, kind of near real time, uh, kind of lossless type of, you know, uncompressed um, um, workflows. Yeah, it, it just seems to be such a perfect fit because you've got this virtual world, virtual environment, and you don't have to go out to a physical signal just to go back into a, a signal in your, in your switcher flow. Yeah, um, absolutely. So 2020, 2021, we had zero SDI baseband workflow in any of our productions. So in the last two years for both Overwatch League and Call of Duty League, we've been 100% IP based. Very cool. And Justin, I know you do a ton also in the cloud with both of these technologies. So, you know, why why do these get you so excited? Well, I have uh, had a lot of similar experiences with as Corey um, and over the last you know year and a half. I worked, uh, a lot of the work I did was with a company that set up a, a network of several talk shows and we were doing a couple talk shows every day, Monday through Friday. And at one point they wanted to incorporate, and we, we it was in AWS, we had vMix machines, Zooms, uh, OBS on all different servers. And we were using NDI as the underlying 
uh, foundation really of the entire company, uh, honestly, like without NDI, it never would have worked. Um, everybody was stuck at home. And the only way to, like Corey described, the reliable way, uh, considering everyone's bandwidth at home, was to have cloud-based servers and to remote in, which also gave us, you know, the ability, you know, sort of backup. If somebody's internet went down, somebody else could jump in and take over the show as the TD. Um, so there's lots of power there. We could go into all that, but uh, but NDI was the was the power was the power there. And then at some point they wanted to incorporate a real life studio in uh, Park City, Utah, with some of the talent there. But we already had this robust uh, cloud workflow, so we had to bring in four ISO cameras up to the cloud, so we could cut, so we could still control everything from the cloud. So the way we did it was we had cameras going into bird dog uh, studio converters in the in that studio, which uh, and we used NDI to get to a vMix machine, which then sent out four SRT streams up to the bird dog cloud, which then integrated into AWS. So we were using NDI in the real studio just as a simple way to get the signals into a computer that then sent the signals via SRT up to the cloud. Um, and so we were able to cut ISO cameras and, um, you know, and be and still be able to integrate those people with all the talent that was already at home. And it was a very, uh, I mean, I, I can't believe any of the stuff works, honestly, like <laughs> the fact that we can sit at home and cut real shows and do real high end production remotely is just amazing and um, relatively low cost compared to traditional, you know, baseband SDI workflows and um, so, you know, so, so this is, that's a great use case where we were using NDI and SRT side by side. Um, and um, it was very effective. So cool. I, I think uh, we all touched on some great points there. And I want to ask, um, so, you know, you mentioned cost savings, um, hourly or, or day rental of a truck, hourly satellite uplink time, these add up pretty quickly. Um, and, you know, sort of back of the napkin calculation here, if you're running a couple of servers in AWS, you're looking at, you know, 10, 15 bucks an hour or something like that, uh, plus some data. Um, so really big uh, asymmetric costs there. Do those cost savings, and I'll, we'll go through reverse order starting with you, Justin, do those cost savings allow you to change um, the type of stories you tell and, and where you tell them from? And not just in the sense of remote versus on site, but you know, um, a, a sound stage versus uh, you know a, a much more intimate setting. Well, I think in the example I just gave, that we were, if we had needed, if we had, if we didn't, if we weren't able to transport the video from that studio that we built um, in a relatively low cost way, we never would have been able to do it in the first place. If we had to, even if we had to pay for like live view time. It would have been cost prohibitive, and we probably never would have done it in the first place. And the the, the big reason they wanted to do it is because they wanted four people in the same room to talk. That and we, we all know that you can we can achieve all these things uh, online, but having people in the same room having a real conversation, humans looking at each other, making eye contact, is uh, is unique and powerful and irreplaceable. And it's not, a, and the, the level of communication and dialogue that you can achieve in uh, the real life format rather than in a, you know, in a zoom call or anything like that is, is totally different. It feels different. It looks different. The pe people react differently. They communicate differently and it's more, uh, you know, it's live. So if we hadn't been able to do that, we would have, it, uh, we, we would not have been able to have the quality of conversations that we had in that show on a daily basis, in my opinion. Well, Corey, how about you? As uh, I know, you know, you definitely have some budgets to work with, but, you know, do these cost savings um, help change the stories you tell? Um, to some degree, I guess. I mean, we were always going to tell our story anyways, and we were going to try to take what we were doing in the ground show and basically adapt it to whatever cloud you know, technology we had available at, at the time. So in 2020, when we first started going back online in April, we, we kind of relaunched our broadcast. I think it was actually towards March, somewhere in there. But anyways, long story short, 
when everything closed down and we had to go online, we'd been working with Grass Valley on a lot of their, their AMP kind of platform uh, as kind of early adopters. We were working with them for about a year and a half, starting in late 2018 on their mass control product. So we had a just we had a decision to make that, you know, hey, we need to get as creative as possible to kind of put the components together that we can to build the same show that we were doing in, at the venue. We didn't want it to look like a Zoom call. We didn't want it to look like a bunch of boxes and people talking uh, randomly about, you know, some action on the screen. We wanted to make it a real television production. And that's kind of what we set out to do. We kind of set the bar pretty high. Um, we accomplished that goal, I think. Um, the, it wasn't a hundred percent because a lot of the tech was new. We were, we'd taken it essentially a mass control product that was being developed and kind of shim it in as the, the primary production switcher. And so we kind of had these cascading switchers kind of with signal flow kind of bearing down on mass control and then single output out and then kind of some of our regional stuff. But it was, it, for us, it was really maintaining a, a certain tool set, regardless of cost, that allowed the content creators to be as, uh, as creative as they can to build them the best canvas to paint their picture, right? So latency came into, uh, came into effect. How do we get casters, not only to talk to each other, to Justin's point, right? And we use a lot of team speak and unity for a lot of the communication path or for comms between crew and talent. Um, but we use a lot of SRT, we use nooks out in the field, we use high-end contribution cameras in our, in our talent kits, uh, basically contributing from people's apartments. And so, you know, for us, it wasn't really like, we weren't like adapting, you know, to a different world. We were trying to give everybody the same world so if, if we had a TD running in, in, you know, Oklahoma, their backup could be in Los Angeles because it's all cloud-based and it's all part of this AMP microservice fabric infrastructure, right? So going into 2021, we switched a lot of things out. We virtualized VizTrio and cloud. We did more robust graphics, more uh, robust like replay. But again, latency came to be, you know, quite, quite a thing. And that's why we moved a lot of these services to cloud where, you know, we're just basically using an RDP technology built as Parsec to get into the cloud for these operators to manage their specific pieces of the broadcast, but not really compromising on what it is that we were delivering as terms of the show, because, you know, again, we didn't want it to look like a Zoom call. We didn't want it to look like we were trying to bring in talent from different things and, you know, trying a combination of, you know, WebRT, uh, WebRTC uh, kind of contribution, vMix caller, like all the other little things, you know, that, that are out there to get somebody into a live stream of some kind ended up, you know, defaulting to SRT and high vision running in AWS. And we were saying somewhere in the, you know, I think round trip, somewhere in the 600, 400 millisecond, you know, range, like it was almost negligible in terms of that we had to actually retime the feeds based on where talent was coming from and at one show you know we were having somebody you know uh one of our talent coming in from sweden you know on the same srt line coming into our aws production environment in oregon while they were basically uh collaborating on screen live on air with somebody coming from la so we have we have this latency problem we have to retime all of these different feeds for everything to match but it wasn't really about like compromising you know quality of the show we were trying to build something different and i think that we accomplished that by distinguishing ourselves to still doing our live show like we were in a truck so cool cool and and thanks for touching on uh, some of the latency parts there was uh definitely a couple of questions in chat about latency and uh, thanks for to the audience for throwing in some good questions. We'll get to those in just a second. Uh, I wanted to give Chris a chance to, uh, you know, talk about how um, these uh, these techs are changing the way they tell stories. Yeah, and I think um, I think we have an interesting perspective because we do um, a lot less virtual production uh, versus what Corey and Justin are talking about. You know, when we do live sports, obviously all our cameras and all our participants are there in one place um so you know we don't really have as big of a virtual workflow um you know we're not tapping into vmix but we're bringing in trucks to our productions and things like that um but to your point on logistics and budgets as well i do think these things are changing when we look at some of the projects we look at like 
Right now we're working on developing a live show out of a glacier in Alaska. So really we can't bring a hundred people like our normal productions to these glaciers. We have to figure out how to do these remotely. Now we have all sorts of bandwidth issues and transmission issues. Um, so I, I think that when we look at the future of these technologies, it's gonna allow us to go to really interesting places to do these shows that we typically need larger infrastructure and to do them virtually and remotely. Um, you know, like Remy production is big in the industry we work in, but even going a step further and breaking out um, those Remy's to all the seats being at home rather than in a, a, a unified location, um, as far as directors, TDs, you know, audio mixers, all that stuff, being able to work remotely can open the door for a ton of creativity because you can now take those resources and put them onto location. Um, you know, we, we definitely have defined budgets to work within and, you know, they're not always the largest budgets, but they're not always the smallest, but we're trying to squeeze as much out of them as we can. So, um, you know, moving from the traditional satellite transmission model to like an SRT delivery model for end, end to end distribution, um, there's tons of savings there that really add up for small broadcasters that, you know, not having to do satellite booking times and just being able to turn stuff on and get it to where you need to go. Um, I think that allows for flexibility, but, you know, the cost savings for a small production, it, you know, it, it adds up big time. Um, and, and we can reallocate that to, you know, what new toys can we put in the field rather than in the back end where, you know, at, at the end of the day, consumers might not know how you're getting the pictures to them. They care more about how you're getting those pictures. So um, it all works together for sure. But, um, you know, a lot of times we can reallocate from the kind of unseen back end and put it into the front end and add more toys to the camera tools that we have. Um, so, yeah, I mean, different production workflow for sure from our perspective, you know, we're not doing, you know, like in esports where everyone's at home or the talk shows at home. Um, so we're trying to figure out how to utilize these technologies more with in-person production. Very cool. Well, we're halfway through. I want to get into some technical nitty gritty. Um, and a lot of the questions that I'm seeing come in on the Q&A are around that. So um, in one of the discussion points I had, um, I posed, you know, is NDI just for LAN? And I, this is sort of what I've gathered from our, our talks here, but I'm, I'm curious to know if anybody uh, dissents with this. Uh, is NDI just for a, a LAN environment or a core environment and SRT um, better for the WAN? wide area network where you've got feeds coming in and going out uh, sort of at the edge. So I'll throw that over to Corey. It depends on how much money you want to burn on bandwidth. You know, at some level, if you're going to do NDI and compressed, I mean, you're even from an ISO perspective, you're still 150 megs. So, you know, some of the larger broadcasters probably are going to end up, if they go pure IP, it's going to be more of the 2110 type of transport and, and whatever the future specs of that are, right? Uh, NDI shouldn't just be basically labeled like a LAN product. I think there's a lot of WAN applications, especially with NDI5. Uh, Sienna and some of their broadcast tools open up NDI to do multiple WAN type of cloud kind of collaboration, both from ground to cloud, so physical to virtual, if you will. Um, but it's really like until some of the bandwidth costs come down, you know, to do a full Remy production of like 20 to 30 cameras or 30 sources from a venue, you, I mean, you may be looking at putting a, a, a 10 gig line in from the switch and, you know, how much is that going to cost you? So, you know, I would say that, you know, uh, SRT is a great way to do uh, kind of low cost high quality contribution from ground-based productions as we kind of like turn the corner on this hybrid mode because trucks and those type of things aren't going to go away. They may just be controlling, you know, infrastructure and cloud-based workflows, or they may be still just go back to kind of standalone and, and we're using the truck to do a submix at the, for the show, but we're still doing ISO backhaul for cloud-based production because it's really still the idea of two different shows. You're cutting the show for the guys at the venue, the people that are watching the show there live, and the people that are watching it, you know, via their handset or via YouTube or Twitch or whatever it happens to be, whatever your distribution mechanism is, 
but is is NDI strictly a, a land-based workload? No, I don't think it is. And I think it's going to continue to evolve. And I think that there's a lot of things going on in the industry, like, you know, uh, Nimbret Edge that's going to open up a lot of like what was legacy DTM networks. And, uh, you know, uh, technology has gone leaps and bounds in the last, you know, six months. You know, every six months, there's like a new set of whole new like tools for us to to play with and enjoy. And that that innovation really started with COVID. It really kind of pushed, started pushing the envelope. And I don't think there's any way of stopping that train. I think it's going to continue to go on. So, yeah. Well, hopefully so. I I, I like that train. Um, any any other thoughts from the other panelists on uh, NDI being just for uh, LAN and SRT uh, WAN? Okay. No, um, no, I think, I think Corey hit the nail on the head. You know, he's got the best perspective on these things as possible, but I, I think bandwidth is the hugest thing when you talk about any of this and um, you know, what, what you're able to get out of your main pipe out of your, you know, production is, is going to be a limiting factor in a lot of things that you do. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then also they just announced NDI HX3, right. Which is supposedly much, uh, much lower data, but still high quality. Yep. So that will, you know, go some way in um, in uh, taking care of the bandwidth issue. And then, you know, as our networks just, as the you know telecom companies and every you know everyone's networks just get more robust, um, the uh, SRT and NDI as WAN delivery mechanisms will probably you know will converge. I would think. Yeah. Um Justin, have you used NDI HX of any version uh, on your productions? I have not. I've been sort of adjacent to it, and I just got some uh, some of the high-end Panasonic PTZ cameras that that support it, but I haven't actually played with it yet. Um, so, no. Chris or Corey, have you used uh, NDI HX? Nah, I, for us, it's there's there's pushing the envelope, and we've definitely have had our hand in you know putting some crazy out there, but, you know, some of these newer type of production workflow ideas like HX is still kind of yet to be proven. And until there's like wider adoption of like, be able to, to on-ramp and off-ramp this from different interconnect points throughout your, your production, I think you're still limited in, in what your science experiments are at this point. Cool. Uh, next question I've got, uh, Heads over to Justin um, and then to the rest of the panel. What are you uh, using for a typical bitrate on your SRT feeds? Um, let's see. I think that uh, typically, I think we're around like 4,000 or 6,000, depending on, you know, depending on really the internet at the venue where we're sending out the SRT feed. Um, I think I've gone up to 8,000 maybe, but. Um, yeah, I think I'm like usually around like four, five, six. Cool. Yeah, that, that seems the, to be the sweet spot where uh, we encounter a lot of SRT feeds. What about uh, Corey and Chris? I'll let Chris answer first, then I'll follow up. I feel like I've been talking. No, no, no. You guys probably have a better perspective on this. You know, I, I, I'm not... Um, I'm not the one setting up the feeds in or out of our productions, so... Um, I always defer to them on those sort of things, but typically, you know, I, the 4,000 to 6,000 seems right. I was going to say somewhere in the 5,000, you know, range is something that I had on my radar, but yeah, you guys probably have better perspective than me on that. We typically try to, for SRT contribution, depending on the, the bandwidth at the location we're pulling from, we're typically somewhere in the, the 10 to 20 megabits per second. Uh, we try to get as much quality as we possibly can because it's going to get transcoded and re-encoded elsewhere down the line. Um, so that the the better quality we have coming in, the the better output we'll actually have. Um, so it's not all just like, hey, let's get a three megabit stream out of somebody's apartment and hope for the best and upscale it to 4K up and way out the door because you're just going to enhance noise and other uh, artifacts in that, that stream. So um, we, we take a lot of pride in as much contribution bandwidth as, as possibly we, we can get. Um, and our workflow is SRT in, NDI was NDI in the, in the core. And then we, we send it back out HLS as contribution to, 
to YouTube. And then we send it through other channels like LTN to our media distribution partners in Europe and, you know, other places around the world. Corey, can, uh, when you guys are doing that, is there any back and forth between the outgoing 10 or 20,000 um, K stream when you're going back to a person, do you have conversations go back and forth? And do you, um, I'm just curious when you're using that kind of bandwidth, um, do you have conversations that uh, require good latency, uh, low latency? Yeah, so the video contribution over SRT is, is de-embedded audio. So we're really like pulling their audio stream off of our Unity channels. So they're, they're kind of not the same, but we resync them behind the scenes and we retime them. So they can speak live one to another, you know, in real time, almost on, uh, on the Unity side. Uh, some of the players are using TeamSpeak, production crew are using kind of a hybrid of, of both. Um, but, you know, it's all like, once we get the streams upstream, you know, they can, so the talent can talk to each other and they're, they're in very low latency to each other. It's how we mix them back into production because there's so many other show elements that are, that are happening. So we may have 14 different places in the, in the broadcast that we're retiming. So it all looks correct on the way out to YouTube, but internally there's, there's kind of pods of contribution that also have to be retimed to kind of make it all work. Um, and I, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Wait, and I, we did. Oh, can I just, uh, yeah, we, we've yeah, done a similar thing in that, um, that example I said, when we had the cloud, uh, cloud-based workflow with the live studio and some talent at home, we found with, uh, with SRT, the having the conversations between the people in the studio and the people at home, what didn't, the audio didn't work uh, very well. It was kind of awkward. Uh, so we started using vMix call just for like you use unity for the talent to speak with each other, yep. but we used the higher quality audio coming in over SRT to actually go out on the stream. Um, so we sort of did a similar thing you guys are doing with um, a different tool. Yeah. And again, there's like, there's several different tools out there to, to slay the same, you know, business problem. It's just, you know, what's going to work better for your workflow? What's going to work better operationally? What can you get support out of, you know, from a vendor perspective, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you don't want to like build everything from the ground up and then be strapped and dependent on this thing for the end of time, right? Yeah, like a lot of our philosophy is 90% off the shelf parts, 10% is the glue that, that brings it all together is the special sauce, right? So like we really rely heavily on the industry, uh, you know, in our partnerships to, to get us where we need to be. And I think that everybody should be, you know, having that same kind of mentality or model. I, I think that there's very diminishing returns on invest investment by building from the ground up. Curious, awesome. just piggybacking that video or the audio latency issues that you guys work with on these virtual productions. What about video return latency? Cause you're talking about syncing later. Um, how do you return program to your participants or your contributors? Or do they not get, you know, a real-time program return? Do they not need it? You know, I'm always, that's something that seems to be an issue is syncing all these elements, but then those take time to sync and then deliver back to your contributors. Sure. So we're typically using basically an IP-based multi-viewer. Uh, in the AMP world, it's a flow player or flow, uh, um, what do they call flow monitor, sorry. Uh, but essentially it's it's in sub-second back to the, um, back to the talent in the cast. So if the talent is out of sync, you we're gonna hear about it because they're mm -hmm. saying stuff either in the future or, or behind in terms of gameplay. So it's very noticeable when we get uh, AV uh, sync problems. Mm -hmm. And in my example, we used, uh, again, we, we would use VMix call to send a the program back to the people in the studio on a big monitor so they could see the video playbacks and what's going on. And that was, uh, that worked well. And then for everybody else on the back end, we would uh, spit a multi-view out of vMix and put it in Zoom with NDI by NDI, and everybody would uh, everybody would just be watching in you know what would be watching the multi-view in Zoom. And I mean, I would be pressing a button in my house up to a cloud, you know, over from Colorado to Virginia, that then goes to Zoom somehow. It comes back to Colorado, and it was nearly instantaneous from when I would push a button going up to AWS through Zoom and back to me, um, just like mm -hmm. really amazing. So, yeah. You know. The, cool. the, 
the thing is the technology is there, right? So, you know, we, we get together as technologists and discuss these things in these panel discussions, but it's really like we're helping expose and, and provide guidance on, you know, hey, this is a solid framework. This is, you know, things that we've done to make things work and giving other people the ability to think creatively and go out and find those other tools as well and put them together in their own workflows. Like none of the, I don't think any of this stuff is really like building space shuttles anymore. Uh, and we have to, as an industry, get out of the fact that, you know, we're, we are building space shuttles. Like there's so much innovation that's happened in the last couple of years that this stuff is readily accessible to, to pretty much any broadcaster that, that has the, uh, the mind to go out and experiment with it and pull something together. And, and it's interesting to think of the, you know, kids in college or even younger than that, that this is how it's done from day one. You know, yeah. we're all diving in later in our professional careers but what are people going to do with this that this is the normal you know that yeah. that i find is the most exciting aspect of these technologies is that um like we mentioned earlier democratizing broadcasting now you can do it for very cheap you know very affordably with your laptop and all these web you know it's so much more accessible and how people use it is going to be what's interesting and how they pull all these different solutions in. Um, I think mm -hmm. I'll, I'll do my interpretive dance now that I uh, alluded to earlier. Um, I think for a lot of us that, you know, if broadcast was up here and streaming was down here and we started in broadcast and, and you know, maybe the popularity of broadcast is kind of going down, but streaming is coming up very rapidly in a very disruptive manner. And we're at the intersection of it right now. And uh, I love the fact that you mentioned, you know, we've got all these, however many, tens to hundreds of thousands of Twitch and YouTube and every other social media platform streamers that are um, using these tools and coming up with creative ways to use these tools that are going to blow us away and impress us. So, um, mm -hmm. And that it's not a single vendor solution. And, and that's some of it's you know, open source and free. Um, on, on the open source uh, versus free tip, does it, does it factor into anybody, any of the panelists um, decisions that NDI is a, uh, you know, free, depending on who you are, uh, library uh, and set of technologies and, and closed sourced, whereas SRT is free and open source? Um, for us, you know, we, you know, our legal department will have one thing to say about different, you know, open source things, you know, depending on what they are. Um, the I think for us, like we want to attach ourselves to uh, tools that have a well-established development community, regardless if it's pure open source or if it's like a, an NDI type product. Um, you know, New Tech has been kind of pioneering this thing for quite some time and they have a lot of development resources behind the product, you know, so for us. It's really like, you know, again, operationally, how do we, how do we get support? Is there somebody to call at 5 a.m. when the show goes offline and we're broadcasting out of Asia? You know, so it's it, it's kind of like you still have to think of the normal workflow routine that you would have in traditional broadcast with like your operations staff, the people that are actually in the MCR running the show, the people that are still going to have to pick up a phone and, and call somebody like you can't do that with a lot of open source because that support channel doesn't exist. So, you know, even if we can push all the envelopes on this, the high end of the technology here, uh, you still have to operationally ground it. And that's what a lot of people, I guess, don't really understand. Like, nobody cares if, if, if uh, cat videos go off online for YouTube. Sponsors will care if my esports broadcast falls over on YouTube, right? Um, so it, it's kind of, you know, you look at the, the world and, and, and how you support it as a, as a business. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, sort of on that, uh, NDI five, we've touched on a couple of times now. Um, well, first I uh, just kind of throw out some, some yes or no questions. And, uh, has anybody used, uh, Amazon's CDI solution in any of their workflows? This is a question from the audience, by the way, uh, or, or Cinti, uh, 2110. Uh, uncompressed video over IP. Are these factoring into your lives at all? They are not right now. Um, we've looked at CDI. CDI is still 
not necessarily a turnkey solution. It's still at SDK that you have to integrate into some other kind of source to get up to uh, Media Connect uh, as an interconnect point. Um, we we use a lot of Zixi in our workflow. The problem with Zixi is that it doesn't allow us to get to the latency train in the transport for contribution as we need because of the way that it does its four error correction, the amount of latency it's built into the actual protocol to actually get things stable, especially if you're pulling out of you know odd places with jitter on the line and whatnot from a network perspective. Zixi is great for that, but it doesn't allow us to get to low latency. And I don't think CDI is necessarily gonna necessarily change the world but we'll have to see how, kind of how the, the overall adoption is from um, the broadcast community. You know, uh, Again, you still have to build the product to get contribution to cloud even over SDIs or uh, CDI, sorry. So you're, you're still having to, to buy your own development resources to, to pull it off. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, NDI5 is also promising its own version of reliable UDP transport and I've, I've been trying to get further details on that, but I haven't been super successful. Does anybody have any uh, experience with that or, or uh, a feeling that that's coming or overall, um, you know, eagerly awaiting it? We're, we're excited to see kind of how it, how it evolves. You know, like we'd like to see NDI be cloud transparent, um, LAN transparent, so to speak. Uh, I think that there's a lot of professional tools that Sienna has built in terms of their uh, support of NDI over uh, multi-cloud, multi-WAN. Um, and so that has been a great tool set for us to, to play with and, and figure out, like if you have five different locations you're contributing feeds to and bandwidth is not an issue, like Sienna is a, a great way to uh, collaborate all of your production you know, feeds together. I've, yeah, I've, and with a lot of stuff I've done, like we've, yeah, we, we looked into Sienna, but it was cost prohibitive for the uh, production I was working on. And we did use some bird.cloud stuff, which was pretty cool. Um, it got a little tricky sometimes, but the, yeah, the the hope of, I mean, if, if NDI could work remotely and go up to a cloud or, you know, if it could be uh, interoperable like it is on a LAN, that would be amazing. And we also ran into issues with, multi-track audio with a night with a good way to have remote multi-track audio going between machines and uh we never were able to crack that code last year i haven't really gotten into it in the last six months or so but um we were hoping that ndi5 would um would help with cracking that code um but i'm not sure if it's there haven't i haven't really haven't really tinkered around recently Very cool. Um, another question from our audience. Uh, what is your preferred platform for uh, uh, group meetings, Microsoft Teams, Zoom, uh, Skype, these sort of tools? Do you have a preference there? And how are you getting NDI feeds out of those? And just general uh, love it to hate it uh, ranking of those. I'll throw that one over to you, Justin. Well. Um... I like Zoom. Zoom is Zoom works. Zoom is ubiquitous. The, like I said, the latency is remarkably low. I don't even the smartest people I've ever talked to do not understand how Zoom gets the latency as low as they do. Um, some companies I work with use Teams, and I find it to be a little glitchier than Zoom. Um, so I don't like it as much. Um, when uh, Zoom at first I think didn't have NDI support, but then they did. Um, they added it, which made you know, which uh, helps. Uh, immeasurably, obviously, Skype uh, had NDI support before Zoom, and I was able to get some good, some some very high quality um, remote contributors using that. And um, I can't remember if it was Skype or Teams, but uh, it allowed you can have a lot of people. Um, I one of them splits off um, ISO audio from all the different participants uh, cleanly out to um, via NDI out to you know VMix or something like that. Um, but I do not believe Zoom does that uh, readily. Found some other ways around that, but um, you know, so those are my thoughts. And uh, AV sync, I see a lot of questions around audio video sync. Do you find a, a wide difference in, um, in, in the different platforms and how well they maintain AV sync? 
Um, Zoom is like pretty good. We all know that there's a little bit of lip flapping going on in Zoom. I also feel like that it's to the degree that most viewers don't care that much. Like in a, you know, I'll, I'll keep it with my example in a talk show environment. Um, it's close enough though. Um, I'm not really, I feel like Skype has better quality, has better picture quality, but I'm not really sure what the, uh, how Skype and Teams compare with Sync. All right. Any of the other panelists uh, have a strong feelings on this? No, I mean, the only time I use any of these collaboration tools is really for conference calls and stuff like this. So we don't use uh, Zoom or any other type of technology for doing uh, talent acquisition um, into our broadcast feeds. I, so I'd echo that. We, we haven't used it as a acquisition device. We've used it as a collaboration device, you know, whether it's in the background of different, you know, remote conversations, but typically uh, acquisition would not come from um, these sort of conference tools. All right, yeah, that's one solution. It's just don't use it. Um, <laughs> another question from our audience, and this is one that I'm a, a big fan of, uh, contribution from mobile devices using either of these technologies. Uh, anybody have any experience with that? Yeah. Uh, the few remote productions we did do during the, the pandemic and continue to do and been using the Live View platform um, with their mobile app and a really great tool for getting someone remotely online quickly with high quality um, speaking to all these latency issues. So, um, you know, I, it was a great tool, easy to use and integrate into the productions that we had going on. And then were you taking NDI out of your live view head end by chance? It was not coming out NDI out of that okay. end, but um, yeah, it was using the live view flavor of SRT to get to us, however. Got it, got it. Um, I have yeah, used, um, and I've used a iPhone and an iPad with the NDI app to go to send over Wi-Fi to a vMix machine, like in a live music performance. Um, with a DJ in particular. And um, we've also, we've wanted to try it more with um, like festivals and stuff and concerts and bringing a mobile device out into the crowd and transporting over uh, NDI uh, over a Wi-Fi network. But it's, ge it's generally tough in, the, with the, in these big, with big crowds, obviously, you know, to get Wi-Fi uh, to cut through all the noise and to, um, to have a reliable uh, NDI stream going, you know, a up to you know several hundred feet um, to a Wi-Fi uh, to a Wi-Fi point. So um, we've I've we've definitely had some have had some success in more controlled environments with that, and it can be really fun, and it can add you know it can add a whole other element like a, you know like a DJ holding up a phone, holding up an iPad on you know with his hand or or on a, a selfie stick or something like that, and then you know ha having the flexibility to go out into the crowd. Um, so that stuff is kind of fun. I've haven't really I can't say that I've perfected that with my colleagues and our workflows, but we've had some, we've had some good experiences with it that helped tell yeah. the story in an interesting way. Yeah. Mobile uh, contribution from portable personal devices. I, I, I'm really looking forward to how uh, content creators such as yourselves are, are bringing that in because it, it's a really neat uh, angle to the story. Cool. Um, I, I don't think we have any real, um, not to discredit anybody, but any network operators or, or um, system admins on. There was a question from the audience regarding um, VLANs and I guess a broader question of um, how, what are you doing to ensure your network infrastructure is good enough to handle all of this IP based uh, video feeds bouncing around? Um, Corey, I'm going to throw this one over to you first. Uh, so it depends on, again, when we're operating, right? So typically at a venue event, a lot of it is going to be baseband SDI, right? Um, we basically run that into an encoder that converts it to SRT as a contribution feed. And then we have a private link that sends it up to AWS Direct. So we use a lot of uh, uh, Ethernet services from the switch at, at our venues or Blackstar Group, at, depending on what venue we're in and um, our esports uh, partners. Um, 
So from there, we're basically tunneling in AWS directly into the venue. So we're basically two or three hops away from a media connect instance from the, from the venue. So once it leaves the physical world, it's, it's hundred percent IP all the way back through the, to the chain. Um, but again, I, there's a lot of bandwidth that we have in, in AWS cloud and we provision our availability zones and our, our VLANs uh, accordingly. Uh, we don't segment too much. We try to keep most of it kind of a flat network, but a lot of the media services workflow components do have high, um, uh, you know, high bandwidth connections in between those two. And even from, from cloud instance to cloud instance, like if we're going from, um, you know, ingesting in Germany all the way back to, to Oregon, uh, like we see a lot of like high throughput and we're not being charged, you know, instance to instance. It's only when we leave the AWS environment that we actually get charged quite a bit of money for that in terms of, you know, out of bandwidth transit uh, or out of stamp transit. Uh, but we haven't really seen a whole lot of bandwidth problems, you know, in using cloud-based production. So uh, our ground equipment, our field kits and stuff like that, that are managing a lot of the games. I mean, it's just a couple hundred, you know, a couple one gig links that are running around the venue. Yeah, so nothing too exotic from a network standpoint. Um, no. Well, I think uh, we're just about out of time. So um, I wanted to give everybody a minute for a uh, parting thoughts on these technologies and um, what you think uh, the future holds for you. And uh, so, Chris. Yeah. No, I think it's it's really impressive to hear Corey talk about what they're doing in the esports world because that's obviously um, probably the best case study for these virtual workflows and and how they can operate and um, they're really leading the charge and kind of these huge collaborations over um, you know different participants from around the world um, with a high demand for quality and delivery. So it's impressive to hear um, what you guys are doing. Um, you know, I think the future holds, who knows, like we're talking about every six months, it's going to change, but we, we can tell it's all going to get better, faster, more accessible. Um, you know, I can't wait till just like bandwidth becomes more readily available as Corey was just saying, you know, when it comes down to any of these things, you got to have the bandwidth to make them work. Um, so, you know, being able to make these work remotely on smaller bandwidth usages, you know, it's all really exciting to see where it could go. Um, and also it just becoming, you know, more digital, more on the cloud. That's it's a it's a whole new paradigm in broadcasting. So, um, yeah, it's it's an exciting time for sure. It's a lot to keep up with. Definitely. Justin, what are your parting thoughts? I agree. It's a lot to keep up with. Um, I've known about NDI for I don't know, for quite a while. Um, I didn't really know anything about SRT or cloud based workflows or any of this stuff until uh, August of 2020, really. And I just my when I got into all this stuff my my brain just started exploding in like the best of ways and I could feel my all my neurons just like firing and like learning all these AWS workflows and how all these different standards can how we can use them to achieve what we used to do with by plugging in BNC cables um, is really amazing and exciting and uh, I'm really looking forward to the continuation of the development of NDI to like we've been talking about to be able to easily transport things locally and then over the internet to completely other facilities and have the same degree of ease as you do on a LAN. And like I said too, with the with NDI5 and with being able to have multi-track audio transporting over these um, over these networks um, would be amazing. You know, if we could sort of leapfrog over the Dante and Maddie kind of stuff uh, for, you know, cause I'm just a lowly video person. I don't, you know, and um, that, that would be wonderful. And also with, with video compression as a, uh, as you know, NDI HX3 um, starts to, you know, hopefully be able to have much, much lower data rates, but retain the quality as, as other video compression technologies have come along in the past, like H.264 and stuff like that um, will, you know, will be, really exciting um, to be able to open up the possibilities of transporting many, many, many video streams over um, existing networks. Cool, thank you for that. And Corey, last but not least. 
Sure. Uh, my two cents is uh, the technology, to Chris's point, is going to continue to increase. We're going to have new tools and new things in our toolboxes to play with, as Justin was uh, calling out. Like maybe it's HX3, maybe it's the next version of JPEG XS. Like we don't know exactly where things are going to go. We just know that we're all here to help drive that innovation, right? As, as broadcasters, as tinkers, as um, you know, technologists, like everybody that's attending this, you know, webinar right now today is doing their own in innovation in their own incubation lab of some sort. Like they're, we're all doing science experiments. Uh, you know, the only reason why we're here today with all of the cloud advancement is because of the fact that there was a, a, a great demand and need uh, across the industry to get people back on the air, get people back to work. It was, you know, we weren't going to be able to wait for the pandemic to kind of just magically go away before we sent people back to doing live production. TV was pretty boring the first, you know, quarter or two of uh, uh, 2020, to be quite honest. And, it, you know, I mean, I, we can make light of some of it now because we've kind of found our groove as, as a world and is kind of like continuing to, to, to fight forward. But at the end of the day, like, you know, um, happy to, to collaborate with anybody, happy to, to share my ideas and my thoughts and, and, and continue to work with our partners and, and innovate of, uh, you know, how we do this, whether it's a hyper ground based production or it's simply a, a remote ISO backhaul and we cut, cut it in the cloud. Like I, to, to me, it's the creation of the television product that, that moves the imagination and the emotions of the people viewing it. Uh, whether it's on a handset uh, delivered device, whether it's at your PC, whether it's at the large screen format uh, television you have in your, uh, in, your, in your home. Like we're here to provide the technical canvas for all of our content creators that rely on us to build the next creative experience. So. Awesome, well put, thank you everybody. I think those are some great ideas there. Excellent. That was a terrific panel. So many great questions from the audience. So many great insights from our panelists. Thanks to all of you. Thanks to our audience for being here. Thanks to Bird Dog and Harmonic for sponsoring. The winner of the Amazon gift card for this session is Eric Fries. Eric, congrats and look out in your email for more information about that. Probably next week. Join us in 30 minutes when we talk about live production from the cloud. So I'm guessing I'll see a lot of you back here then. See ya.